Good morning and welcome to The Key Points with me, Abna Tabi. It is the 14th day of December 2019 and we are back here. It's another Saturday to look at matters that made the headlines during the course of the week. Uh, we are coming to you from the studios of TV3 here in Accra. We're also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also at, my, at our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. As usual, we encourage you to send through your comments and your reactions or contributions to our WhatsApp line 020-21-66633, and we will try as much as possible to read quite a lot of them during the course of the program. This morning, we are looking at a number of things. We'll start off with a look at the President's Meet the Press. And just yesterday, the 13th of December 2019, the president interacted with the media to account for his stewardship um, after three years in office. Now, interestingly, this account of stewardship um, by the president came at a time when think tank Imani had published a report scoring the government 48.78% on the delivery of its 2016 campaign promises. Now, this score of 47.78% constitutes a lower end of satisfactory progress per the Imani assessment um, scoring scale. Sorry. Now, the president, while answering a question posed to him by one of the participants at the engagement with the media yesterday, expressed his disagreement with Imani's score of 48.78%. Now, according to the president, his government rates its implementation of campaign promises around 72%. Now, on the show this morning, we shall be looking at the president's media encounter alongside the 2019 e manifesto report also on a related matter in a related matter we'll turn our attention to the 2019 afro barometer and this week the cdd issued another news release i believe the fourth this year regarding uh, findings in the 2019 afro barometer survey now the cdd appears to have serialized um, the release of the findings of 20, the 2019 Afrobarometer survey. You will recall that uh, a couple of weeks back we looked at um, infrastructure concerns of the people, then we looked at the economy, now we are looking at elections. So this week's news release revealed, among other things, that 12% of Ghanaians are undecided or do not know which of the two dominant political parties they would vote for in the, a presidential race, that is the NPP and the NDC. Now, 11% also say they will not vote. And another um, startling finding was that the youth were twice as likely as older citizens to say that they would not vote. Now, the findings also reveal that the proportion of respondents who said they would vote for the ruling NPP has declined by 15% from 49% in the 2017 survey to 34% this year, while the share of respondents who said they would vote for the NDC remained unchanged at 22%. So what are we to make of these figures or statistics coming out from the 2019 Afrobarometer survey? And then lastly, we'll turn our attention still on elections to an impasse between the Electoral Commission and opposition parties over um, the decision to have a new biometric voters registration system. So we'll try to understand exactly what caused um, the walkouts by the NDC and some other opposition parties this week. These are the topics we have for you this morning. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we will delve straight into the issues. This is a key point. Stick and stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome. This is The Key Points. We are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also at um, TV3 Ghana on our Facebook page. So we'll be delving straight into issues here. Let me quickly introduce the panel for today's conversation. From my extreme left, we have the Honorable Osei Bonsu Amwa, who is the MP for Equipment South constituency and also the Deputy Minister for Local Government and Rural Development. Next is Dr. Ali Duseidu. He is a senior lecturer at the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana. And to my right, we have Dr. Ahmed Jnapo. He is a senior lecturer at the University of Education. Whenever we also have, um, we're expecting the final guest. When she comes in, we'll do uh, the needful and introduce her according. But good morning, gentlemen, and welcome morning. to the show. Good it's great to have you here, as usual. Um, <clears throat> we'll start off with... Um, a, a look at um, events that happened during the week. Obviously, we are starting off with a look at the launch of the um, Imani report, which assessed government's performance on its uh, delivery of uh, 2016 
election promises. And that would definitely dovetail into the president's Meet the Press encounter yesterday with the media, where he actually had an opportunity to respond to a question in respect of the Imani report. So we'll take some snippets of uh, those two events during the week and then return to the panel. The manifesto is a progress report which seeks to evaluate the rate of execution of the promises made by the NPP in the run-up to the 2016 polls and how many of those promises have been accomplished three years on. According to the report, the new patriotic party NPP made 510 promises in its 2016 manifesto dubbed Change, an agenda for jobs, creating prosperity and equal opportunity for all. The project assessed thematic areas of governance, economy, social sector, infrastructure and human capital investment to carry out an output based assessment. They fulfilled. Some of the promises we don't even agree with. If we take school feeding, when it was being, no parent in this country asked for their kids to be fed. And today, school feeding has become a huge bureaucracy and when you go into it, you see the trouble with that thing. All right? But they said they would do it. We don't agree with it, actually. But they've done it, so we take it. All right? So we don't put that qualitative issue there. And On the economy, it revealed that out of 162 promises, only 41 have been implemented, culminating into a score of 54.35%. Under governance, which has corruption, governance and public accountability as part, the akufuado led government scored 23.60%. On governance, Imani noted that the government is yet to undertake legal reforms on assets declaration. It however noted that government had delivered its promises on security and foreign affairs but failed as far as the election of metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies. Government again scored 43.47% in the energy sector, 47.98% on economy, trade and industry after 87 captured promises. It further scored 50% on economic policy objectives, 69% on macroeconomic stability and 61% on economic management and taxation. By scoring 48.78%, government is deemed to have performed satisfactorily. This also translates to the fact that looking at all the promises in the manifesto we examined, they have been able to implement 48.78%. Some not full implementation, but uh, some around 25% of this, they've done full implementation. So we find them in very good, um, fair, satisfactory progress. But there were calls for a further analysis into the impact the fulfillment of these promises has had on Ghanaians. The other measure we could adopt is to do surveys, which is the best impact assessment anyway. Of any, of any significant government policy. The NDC member of parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam George, argued that the project being quantitative will not reflect the living conditions of Ghanaians. The MPP government is so high for the aviation sector, for example. One is going to ask, um, what have they done in the aviation sector to warrant such a high score? So quantitatively may look good, but qualitatively many themselves admit that they have not looked at the qualitative aspect of it. The policy think tank intends to present a final scorecard in 2020 ahead of the general elections. With the 48% assessment, I think it's a much higher assessment in terms of campaign promises that have been delivered and are being delivered. The figure that we're working with is a figure of 72%, not 48%, in terms of the promises that have been delivered and those that are in the course of being delivered. So we have a fundamental disagreement on the, the figures. We believe that there's enough information that can be assembled to show that our figure, our assessment, is the, is the accurate one. The size of government, I heed the cause. It's come from some quarters. I'm not quite sure that it is necessarily the call of everybody. But I believe that the work that this government has, has done, the output, would have been difficult with a smaller number. 
The machinery of government in our country is such that if the political direction at the top is not strong, the delivery becomes a, 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 an issue. And I, be, I still stand by the fact that the numbers were necessary for the work that we have done. And that when you look at the output, it would have been difficult to have obtained that output without the numbers. The ambulances. The Minister for Special Development Initiatives who's been responsible for bringing them told me about a month, six weeks ago, that some of the ambulances were in, should she distribute it? And I said, no, she shouldn't. She should wait till they all come in. So one day we can distribute them all at the same time to all 275 constituencies. I saw myself getting into a tremendous amount of issues if you started distributing some and others didn't get it. Fortunately for us, all of them will be in by the end of this month. 160 odd are already in and the balance are on the high seas will be here by the end of the month. The 300 will be there. On the 6th of January, I will commission them and then the distribution will take place simultaneously across the country and nobody's going to accuse me of favoritism, regionalism, this and that and that. So that is, 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 is the short answer to your question. Instructions have gone from me to everybody in my government that they have to cooperate with the special prosecutor. Um, he made these statements some time ago. I haven't had them repeated recently. And I'm assuming from that, therefore, that the directive that I gave of cooperation uh, is working. But I've made it clear to the special prosecutor that if ever there are some kinds of obstacles or barriers that I can help jump and overcome. Of course, I'm willing, I'm ready and willing to do so. I've not had an opportunity to discuss anything with him in the last few months. I know he's doing his work. He's supposed to be an independent person. He is an independent uh, official. And I, I, I'm reluctant to be attempting to micromanage or get involved or be seen to be meddling in, in his remit. He's a very experienced public official. He's getting on with his work. And all of us will be judges of the quality of that work. So that is what I would say. And it means that, uh, do I say I'm happy or unhappy with his work? He's getting on with his work. So that's all I can say. Um, the Affirmative Action Bill has been a very controversial bill. It's gone through several ups and downs and we're hoping that we're now at the last stage of, the, of, 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 of its movement. Um, hopefully. <laughs> um, it's, it's due to come back to cabinet again. There's been a recent round of stakeholder consultations on it, and it's due to come to cabinet again for a final review. Great, so that was a president, Nana Dodanko Kufato, there yesterday addressing um, the press at the Jubilee House. Um, a number of issues came up. You heard him talking about um, the Office of the Special Prosecutor. He also touched on um, other things regarding the flagship project of his government and how far they've gone with it. Also reacting to the Imani report, which scored <coughs> his government 48.78% in terms of the delivery of their campaign promises of 2016. Um, let me quickly introduce um, our final panelists who joined us in the person of um, Madam Joyce Bawa Mokhtari. She is the spokesperson of former President John Dramani Mahama. Good morning, welcome. Good, good morning. to have you. Good morning and good morning to all of you. Great. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. So um, we're starting off with the Imani um, report, and let me just, you know, for purposes of, you know, um, putting it in, in perspective, this, uh, according to their report, this assessment uh, presents the status of implementation of the promises of the 2016 NPP manifesto. Importantly, let's note this, that it's not an impact assessment report, but an assessment of the state of implementation of the NPP's promised 
uh, promises sorry, aimed at creating prosperity and equal opportunities for all. So essentially it's an output, output based assessment and um, that sets the tone for us. So let me ask, I, I want to start from you, Doc, um, Dr. Um, Ali Duseidu. This is, as I indicated, is an assessment based on output, not necessarily impact that these um, performance of government, if you like, has, has yielded. And it scores government of 48.78% in respect of that. Now, it's broken down into five sectors, the economy, human capital, investment, social policy, and infrastructure, as well as governance. Each of these sub-themes, if you like, scoring their respective um, um, percentages. What do you make of this whole process? Uh, thank you very much. I, I think uh, it's a good thing to do, one, because it actually brings accountability to our governance process. Over the years, we've seen politicians making promises that they can't even remember when they, when they get to government. So an activity of this kind actually enlightens our democratic process. It brings the context of ideas rather than just the context of mind. So I think it's a good thing to start with, to keep governments on these tools, and to also make sure that political parties just don't promise anything, because they know at the end of the day, there will be a group that will hold them to account. Right. Having said that, I, I think Imani could have done better than what they have done. Right. One, an output-based assessment does not clearly say so much. We should have moved away from output base to looking at impact base. So if you look at their methodology, I think they did a three classification binary of a sort. So they are looking at, the, they asked two questions actually, they, they sought to answer two questions. One, what promises were made under each category and subcategory? And then two, were those promises fully or partially implemented? And based on that, they came out with these figures. And what they did was that three binary, if a promise is achieved, they score it one, if a promise is not fulfilled, the score is zero. If it's partially fulfilled, the score is a fraction, say 0.5. Now, there is a difference between achieving an output, whether full or partially, and then the impact of that output on the lives of the people. Basically, if you look at the context of development, development has moved far away from just looking at uh, the economic growth, providing infrastructure, and all those things. It basically has to do with the impact that these projects have on the lives of the people. And if you read Amartya Sen, I think that's the major point he's making. If you read the Human Development Report prepared by the UNDP, it's all about gradually development shifting away from all these other things, which are seen as what? An, a, a means okay. to an end. And the end is the welfare and the well-being of human beings. I'll give you examples from three sectors. So one, pick maybe the free senior high policy. They can give you figures. Oh, about this number of people have been enrolled since started, this number of people have been enrolled, this is what's happening. What is the impact? So if Imani Ghana is going to take free senior high, it will be one, achieved. But what is the impact? We are assuming that moving to maybe in the medium to short, uh, in the medium to long term, we want to build a human capital, human basal source. That can be able to take care of our needs. That can be able to add value to the resources that we have and to, and to develop this country to that particular regard. Now, Let me ask, though, um, looking at... I'm glad you talked about the medium term. Obviously, this was within a short time, um, um, timeline. Question is, can we assess impact within this period? It will be, dif it exactly will be, it will be so difficult to do. But definitely, you can also make projections. So I'm, I'm just relating this. So one... If you look at this course on, on, on say, free senior high, it will be ticked one, achieved. But if you look at the general score per categories, human capital development is the lowest achievement. Right. That is 39.13%. Right. Compare this to the recently human capital index released by the World Bank. It, it, it showed that about 56% of Ghanaians, sorry, about 66% of Ghanaians' human capital will go waste in the next 18 years because of poor quality of our educational system. And then it, it actually said, went further to say that only 44% of children born in the country today will become productive when they grow up. Mm -hmm. So then you juxtapose this to, to the policy of facing a high. 
then you see that it's, it's, not, it's just a shortfall to measure this, just looking at uh, output. Second, health. Chips compound. A government says, I'm going to build 550 chip compounds. So you go to one particular village, there's a chip compound there. You take one, achieved. That's output. But you go to some of these chip, there are not even nurses there, there are not doctors there, there's no even bed there, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. How does that impact the lives of the people? But in terms of achievement, that is achieved. Right? You go to maybe, there are several examples you can give. Maybe the economy. Mm -hmm. The economy is doing well. But how does that translate into the life of the people? So I think moving forward, what Imani can do to help us so much is to add maybe a third question to the two questions that they have. And then the third question could be, what is the impact? So one, were these policies actually achieved under each category? Two, sorry, what were the policies? Two, have they been achieved? And three, what is this impact on the lives of the mm. people collectively? And I think if they do that, then they can move away from just this three typology binary and then look at the impact. Once they're able to right. do that, it will be good. Right. Um, obviously, this, this discussion on the Iman reports dovetails into what happened yesterday, which is the presidents meet the press. And, you know, as we go along, we'll be blending in issues that come, came up yesterday and, you know, mm. uh, what happened with the Iman report. So, you spoke about the health bit. I would want to follow up quickly, then I go to the others. Your, your thoughts on the president's response to the ambulances and why they are still packed <coughs> in front of the state house. They're waiting for the full complement to come in and then distribute. So I, I think if we bought ambulances in because people need them, I don't see the justification for us to pack it till we get everything. Mm. So Bungpurgu Yuyu needs an ambulance, agently. Then we have two ambulances. Give one to Bumpogu Yuyo and wait. When the rest can we give it to other communities? So maybe from here up to from now up to maybe the time that all the food service will come. If people die as a result of lack of ambulance, then we we'll blame ourselves. So you don't you don't think his 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 his, his um, attempt to justify that saying that he didn't want to be blamed for tribal is it regionalism, favoritism, and all really standable? I, I said them. You see, it, it depends on the on the mm. level of need. Mm. Do you understand? If this community needs it so much so that. Mm -hmm. You can't just wait for the rest to come. Then Before give it to them and let the other constituencies know that there are more coming. Mm -hmm. One day come, we'll let you get it. Mm -hmm. If you do it that way, it's better. I don't see the sense in bringing ambulances and pack them down when people actually need it. When people actually need it somewhere to mm -hmm. be able to deliver healthcare, it doesn't well. make sense. That's to fine. Me. Let me go to Honorable Obiamwa here, and I would throw that question to you. The one, um, Doctor Ali said you just finished off. Even before we go into, you know, um, your thoughts on the Iman report, the president's um, response to that question about ambulances. You do know that this issue has been on the front burner for some time now. People are worried that yes. The ambulances coming in are good, but it will serve no purpose if they remain packed there, even for a day. Because a day could, you know, you could have many casualties or, you know, bad situations occur in a day, which if these ambulances had been distributed, perhaps it could have, you know, curtailed or prevented. So your thoughts on that? Do you think the president's yes. response really and truly is uh, justified? I mean, to say that he didn't want to be accused of favoritism or regionalism, as in... I'm preserving my person as against, you know, well, the, um, the general. Thank you. thank you and good morning to you and to fellow panelists. Well, if you zero in on the ambulances, what the president said was that he wanted to be seen to be distributing the ambulances to every constituency. Mm -hmm. And that hopefully by first week in January, he should be able to do that. I think that's a fair answer, even though I know for TV3, there's been a crusade about <laughs> send, I think it's a send, send the ambulances. Of the entire nation, you know. Send the ambulances. Where they yes. belong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where they belong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I remember even a minority went to take pictures of the ambulances and did a whole press conference on them. Of course, we heard people say, <coughs> if you've brought them, distribute them. Exactly. But the... The ministry also came out, especially development initiatives, especially came out and gave us reasons why they were still packed there. Mm. For instance, I know they, they've contacted the, the districts to prepare for the ambulances, where they will stay and other logistics. But thankfully, once the president has assured us that first week in January, these ambulances should leave the state house well and good i don't think we could, mm. should spend so much time on it we should rather look at the other things he said 
and then um, and this is this is of concern to many yes, really and truly, so which, which is why anyways well we'll move on indeed there are other issues to look at i would want you to look at you see we're trying to i, I mean i do appreciate the Emanuel report yes. totally and but i looking at the report i i had some concerns and so i just want us to look at that even yeah. before we go into whether or not the percentages are signed and all are you know really what what they are I, I'm seeing here in the report that it says this assessment does not take into account activities, initiatives, programs, and policies which the government did not promise but has so, undertaken, okay. which leads, I mean, which raises the issue Doc was touching on about yeah. impact and yeah. the relevance of policies in the lives of the people. Yeah. So that if you're scoring a government and you're saying, well, our focus is on the manifesto promises, and so regardless of what you've done, we don't care because it wasn't part of your manifesto. Yes. How do you, what do you make of that <coughs> well, this, issue this in, a, in this report? Thank you. This is the first time Imani is um, conducting this exercise. It calls it Imanifesto. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done about two or three over the years. And if, as you said, you said they are not really interested in impact. And two, they're only focusing on what is in the manifesto, what has not been done outside the manifesto. And then for the fact that they are more interested in alerting political parties um, to be cautious when they are doing their manifestos or to be realistic. And then they say that working close to reality is the key. That's what they say. So more or less, they, they have drawn the parameters and then they have told the whole world that this is limited mm -hmm. in scope. And for that reason, if you are assessing them, you should also take into consideration the fact that you can't really use this to assess the government to a certain point. And, and also, we should also realize that even in the manifesto, the promises that you put in the manifesto, they will not be of the same impact and then, or the same um, magnitude. And so some, you even need more expenditure. For some, you have to take a certain amount of time to be able to execute. The things that you need, few months you can execute them. So if you take that and give it one, and then for others to where you have to get some time to execute, you also give it the same one mark of strength. And then probably, I don't being too, I don't know the word I want to use, but I believe that they think that they have done what they need to do. And in doing that, that's the score they give. The president is saying that, look, <coughs> I also have my team, we've also done an assessment, and based on the assessment, this is what we've come to. And I'm aware that, indeed, there's a dashboard, a, a team has put together what was put in the manifesto, not even what has been achieved outside the manifesto, what was put in the manifesto, and then ranked those which have been delivered, those which we are delivering, and those which we are, which is spending. So, you, at least, residents is not talking out of a vacuum. He also has his... Um, data to be able to address what the money did. And of course, uh, uh, um, um, research or work done by an independent yeah. body is also worth, you know. Of course, uh, it, it's not being discarded, looking, except yeah. that the, the, the two appear to be post apart in the sense that 48 mm -hmm. and 72. We need to interrogate how do we come by these figures. The money has told us that. Indeed, he only listed what was put in the manifesto. Not in the Welcome back. Uh, sincere apologies for that. Um, we are all fixed up now, so we can go. But um, um, just so we touch base, we're looking at the Imani Report 2019, which scored government some. 48.78% overall after assessing government's performance in five key sectors which were um, put together by reason of the various chapters of the NPP 20, NPP's 2016 manifesto. Um, just before that abrupt break, we were, um, Honorable Obiamo was making the submissions. I'll go to him to finish with that and then move to the other two panelists who are yet to speak. Well, thank you. I was making a point that Imani has been doing this, and they have their own criteria. For instance, they tell us that he, he dwelt on the economy, governance, infrastructure, human capital investment, and social services. 
and based on what they picked from our manifesto. That is how they have ranked us. Mm -hmm. But we are saying that we also have our own dashboard and from what we've done so far and categorizing them into delivered, delivering, and then pending. We think we have scored far higher than what we managed. 72% according to the president. According to the president. The president is spot on because um, we are in December, that's at August. That's what we have put together. Mm. And then, so from August, we even need to add more to it. So wow. that is really the situation. And as I said, they, they appear to rank all the promises the same, which is a bit problematic mm. because if you say that you, you amend an act, um, or you carry out a, a process which maybe takes uh, weeks or days to do it and then you compare that with a major policy that you have to implement and also give them the same um, ranking and uh, uh, so uh, there has to be a problem the, the, um, they should be targeted or the rank should be specific to the kind of policy actions that are being taken yes. you don't necessarily give them an equal because, because if you implement um, let's say free senior high education I, I don't think it, you can rank it the same as maybe expanding school feeding. But would yeah. it, wouldn't that be the reason why they're saying this is a, that's, an that's output why they, based? Yes, yes. yes. So that's why they also uh, yeah. made sure that they, they told us exactly, exactly what they were doing. Sure. But in analyzing it, we can also look at some of these mm. aspects. Very well. And then even the expenditure you have to incur in even mm -hmm. implementing some of them. And Very at the much. end of the day, when we go to the people, we are not going to tell them only about what is in the manifesto, about what we have even achieved mm. outside the manifesto, mm. and to be able to convince them why mm. um, they should vote for us again. And I think the president yesterday did very well. I mean, we, we must really commend him. He was on top of uh, what he was doing, mm. and then he, he responded to almost everything. Mm. And I'm sure at the end of the, uh, the media, we were really satisfied, <laughs> if, even if you don't want to say so. <laughs> Well, it's for the people to say, really and truly. So, but let me come to uh, Madame the, Joyce Bauer here. Just before mm -hmm. I end, the only challenge is that I've seen some networks asking people whether it is true that the MPP has achieved a 72 percent, and then you have this uh, like more or less opinion so poll. Yeah. But the difficulty is that there are some who have even read the manifesto, mm -hmm. and they haven't taken the trouble to even look at what has been achieved or mm -hmm. not. If it's just opinion pool, say your mind, uh, is it true or not? You may not achieve what you really want to achieve. Oh, well. Mm. Well, 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 I mean, people are obviously entitled to do those kinds of polls. It has to be more objective and professional. <laughs> Very well, that's <laughs> fine. It's not just I like, saying it's, it's um, uh, abra pretty, mm. and that one is even subjective. Mm -hmm. And beauty lies in the eye of the uh, world, yes, I but say. Very well. <laughs> yes, but if you want to be scientific and professional mm -hmm. then go for the document very well that's that, that that's that's fine um yes. madam joyce Barr, quick one um the report again making reference to a, a part of it i believe the executive summary says that the key observation from the data is that there appears to be an aggressive strategy by government in ensuring that its manifesto promises are fulfilled mm -hmm. and it says 70 percent of all its manifesto promises have featured in policy design with varying levels of implementation so it, it, it does admit or concede that there's some aggressive you know um, 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 strategy to get its manifesto promises um, fulfilled question is looking at this statement and which goes on to say that 70 percent of all its manifesto promises have been featured in some policy here and there one way or the other do you think the score of 48.78 percent in the scheme of things reflects exactly, you know, the level of aggression that the report suggests government is attacking or attempting to fulfill its promises. Well, thank you very much. A very good morning to you. And of course, good morning to my colleagues who are all here. And good morning, of course, to all who are watching us from home. Well, I do think that uh, this conversation has been going on for quite some time <coughs> now. And as the Honorable himself has actually admitted to, Imani Ghana, has been undertaking these exercises as a policy uh -huh. think tank for quite some time. Indeed, I do think that it's not just Imani we should be talking about. We should be talking about all the others, such as the Afrobarometer, right. such as the uh, uh, CDD, such as IDEC. Many of our civil uh, service organizations really have come out to make some pronouncements in recent times about government's performance or otherwise. Indeed, when you look at the fact that the president engaged the media yesterday, in a run-up to Christmas at the end of the year. And there was no question, really, about jobs, mm. about the number of young people who still do not have 
gainful employment. A beggar's belief that a conversation such as that would actually overlook mm. a conversation about Ghana's youth bulge, about the challenges currently facing young people. I do think that government indeed has tried or, you know, basically is shifting itself away from what the reality is. I think that sometimes we ought to wake up to our responsibilities. There must be a certain reality check. But of course, there's always a certain discomfort at the top of it that once you admit to a certain uh, anomaly, a certain mistake, a certain lack of focus on something, it then shows or uh, makes your government look weak. Mm. And I do think that this is something that I have observed in uh, His Excellency the President's posturing since he assumed office. Mm. I do think that sometimes he thinks he's in a court of law, so he likes to make himself look good, sound good. And yesterday, actually, he sounded particularly very, very elated. And to think he actually scored himself 72%, <laughs> that actually left me wondering. There is enormous hardship in the country. Mm. Yes, Have you been to the fuel pumps lately? Have you observed the number of persons who are striking? Various associations. Indeed, if Imani speaks to the level of aggression, what it means is that the impact has failed to make the desired uh, results on the lives of the people. If indeed government is aggressively promoting its own policies based on a certain outline from its own manifesto, ask what the impact has been this far. And a great example is that of the ambulances, where you promise to secure a number of ambulances to serve each and every district here in Ghana. And then you then say, it's pretty much along the same lines of sloganeering that we've come to associate with this government, that you're waiting until you have the full complement. Check the statistics on health recently. In the eastern region, in the president's own backyard, and of course in Obi's own constituency, the reasons why many maternal mortality cases are being recorded is as a result of lack of a response team when there are emergencies regarding persons who are either pregnant, waiting to have babies, or young babies who are falling ill, etc. These are research statistics that we ought to take seriously. When the praise singing is good and the hymnal reads well for you, it is almost like it reads from a fable of Aesop. You do quickly latch onto it. But whenever it appears to be at variance with government's own thinking, then we develop these conversation lines where we come up with these things. When you speak to ambulances, Listen to the different voices that have come up. The president speaks at various from his own vice president. Mm -hmm. The minister in charge of them herself has said something completely different. Indeed, the last time we spoke about these ambulances was as a result of a documentary by your own media house. The response that we all got as citizens was that government was fitting them, refitting them. Some gadgets were required. Indeed, His Excellency, the vice president, mm -hmm. spoke categorically about needing to put some tracking equipment or is it GPS on these ambulances. So seriously, whose voice should we be taking seriously? Maybe we should take the president's voice now. Coming, As coming, having come coming to exactly. sum up what everybody Maybe. has been saying. But I do think that the president realizes that times are indeed hard, mm. that there is enormous <laughs> hardship. Yesterday's engagement, I think, was to make himself look good, to try very hard to appear to have been in touch with the good people of Ghana, to actually retrace his steps and get back to the days of his extreme campaigning and sloganeering, and of course to try and rehash the conversation about his past promises mm. and trying to get people to think that despite all the recent uh, challenges I have faced or my government has faced, we're still on course. An attempt to reassure the good people of Ghana on whose behalf he seems to be running this country. Mm. But the reality is that we're still waiting for the full complement of ambulances. I would like you guys to check just how many ambulances are in that car park. And of course, why we cannot start to deploy them. So we're waiting for the usual pump and pageantry mm -hmm. that the government is doing Ghanaians a favor that you can use taxpayers' money to procure ambulances and people are dying and yet you want to dictate when it suits you for the cameras and the media and all the usual pump and pageantry. I didn't expect that we'll be hearing something like this mm. in a country whose health sector is probably at the lowest on the African statistics or mm. indexes in terms of health provision for people. Note that a healthy nation really is also a healthy people. Sure, we definitely. have challenges with the national health insurance. Indeed, these were some of the campaign messages that the current government carried in 2016. There's been no improvement. Indeed, we have been forewarned that in the coming year, 
cash and carry will be the new mantra. Mm. So right. certainly not much has happened now, speaking, in speaking terms on of NHI, affecting yes, people. Yes. Speaking on NHIS, I think that was one of the major issues Absolutely. that we discussed. And that and is why I think that the whole conversation yesterday was choreographed, it was stage managed <laughs> to uh, try to... You mean that the, the journalists there to, uh, uh, ask uh, questions uh, that, uh, that, uh, that were... I was expecting where, as an individual, uh, and if uh, I were a journalist uh, in the same I, room, uh -huh. I would probably be asking, why do we <coughs> even have to wait till the full complement of ambulances are received? I would have asked a follow-up question. That's the point. Like was, that, was there an opportunity for that? You do know that it's one question and then you go. So, so maybe, you have many but other to say that it was houses choreographed yeah. raises issues about the, I mean, the, 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 the professionalism and integrity of the journalists because who were there, which then, I think then, is not then fair. Then maybe the others who did not get the opportunity to ask may have asked these questions that are mm. actually jogging my mind. Mm. So there's always that. You know, right. in every room, there is a pros and there's a cons. Definitely. There could be pay persons who would want to ask some probing questions. Indeed, I've seen on social media that some key individuals who we've all associated with asking certain very probing or not so government friendly questions. Indeed, imagine what it looks like when you have a media person having an opportunity once in a very red moon to engage the first gentleman of the land. Mm -hmm. Naturally, there would be a certain need to either try and tickle his fancy, to try and ask <laughs> questions that you think will make people happy. I was expecting yeah, I, I, I that think, we would also have a wow. conversation asking I hope you, why. Give the right guidelines. I, I, I think asking that's your opinion, guidelines. but I honestly <laughs> think I mean if you if you put it that way, you're you're, you're putting the <coughs> yeah, analysis on we, the line. No, 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 because no. great questions. Well, if you ask and me, we, I think this this meet the press was way better than what happened last year. You do recall that the Media Foundation for West Africa actually described last year as the worst ever. I think this so was taking a notch higher. See, so that is the point I'm making. This was taking you a notch higher. Said what I was no, no, no. To I say. don't think it was an answer <laughs> no, 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 to no. yours. Uh, if so you are no, 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 totally. Wait. If you are telling me that this was a marked improvement uh -huh. on what happened last year, so naturally there can still be room for improvement. Yes, yes but not choreographed. So to say it no, was no, choreographed no. is what I'm raising you issues with. Choreographed will have many connotations. It does not necessarily even have to be negative. <laughs> you can decide to ask the president a very In the context question. you use In it. In the context with, I yeah. use it, you could decide to ask the president questions that you think mm. he wants to hear. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that. It is not even against anybody's human rights. But as I said, I would have wanted an opportunity where further questions would have been asked. Sure. Indeed. Definitely. In that, his that's, opening that's remarks, good. the president started to you know, speak largely about some positive outcomes. He mentioned the Terminal 3 facility in particular. He called on persons within the, the, the enclave, the administrators, to manage that facility yeah. effectively. What he failed to do, as always, was to lend credit to where it had actually come from, where the development had come from. On this occasion, I think sometimes it is even beautiful when leadership shows a certain humility. It does bring you even more in touch with the good people of Ghana. But is it also, would it be fair also then to say that when there are, you know, bad times in the pre um, previous administration, then the government should highlight that? Because oftentimes it's like, why do you keep going back to those times? We voted for you to come in to do the right thing or oh to my. continue you, this do, another, do, this do, do, do rectify. This is another question I would have asked yesterday if I was in that room. <laughs> it was almost as if the president had not been in power for three years, that we did not have an election next mm. year. Indeed, everything that was asked about roads, the president said, wait and see what will happen. Mm -hmm. Everything that was asked about ambulances, he says, wait and see what will happen. Indeed, I do think that Ghanaians now have to beg for the president to deliver on his promises. So the mark by Imani, and I am someone who has very clear thoughts on what I want to say mm -hmm. at any given debate. It might not suit someone's interest, okay. but I think that in everything that I say, I have thought very carefully very about well. it. My questions are still outstanding, and I would have looked forward to further proven questions mm. about how the taxpayers' money is yeah. being utilized, and yet government feels to account mm. to the good people of yeah, Ghana. Well, I, I the referendum has just been cancelled. Yes, I was expecting a question yesterday no, on how much. No, on how much was expended. Right. I mean, and whether or not somebody is liable for the amount we that has been expended. We, I, I, I and totally I'm happy get that the local government is right. yes, yes, yes. We could. Yeah. So, but yes, yes, I, I do. I'm I do. trying to make a point. I totally get it. Exactly. But definitely, it's a time-bound thing, and you can't ask. Every, every question so my do point is simple that. yes that if i were in the room i would ask how much was expended very well who is liable for what mm. when are they even going to account to us mm. for how much was involved sure. in this now aborted exercise um, yeah. great thanks, thanks. so he, he will be he will be <laughs> answering that but quickly Doc, dr Ndapo, you've heard the submissions by the three <laughs> co-panelists your thoughts on that do you think 
the, 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 the Imani's <laughs> score of 48.78 um, <laughs> speaks to what is actually happening. Well, I think, uh, first of all, let me say... Uh, Good morning to your cherished viewers. I don't know whether you still have listeners. Oh, we do. Okay, okay. We do viewers have and listeners, listeners and to my colleagues. Uh, let me start by making the points uh, relative to the question that you asked. That, uh, in fact, you've, you've mentioned it, but it needs to be reiterated. What Imani did was not an opinion poll. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, to borrow the words of uh, Madame Joyce Bauer, a reality check. Manifestos are intentions, they are policies that people want to implement and when they are given the opportunity to come into power uh, as to whether they are implemented or not is what Imani did. And I make, I make, I, I, I make reference to this because uh, there are some people who still have a misconception of what this whole thing is about and I'll, I'll give a particular example, I'm told that the Deputy General Secretary for MPP, Mr. Obri uh, is very happy about they getting 48.78%, <laughs> hoping that by next year they would have had 51%. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where. When the president said that he has lost 72%, <laughs> you are hoping you have 51% per the scoring scale, and it would not even be yes. the rest I, of marks. We will still be at the lower end. I still think yeah. it's high. 48 uh, is high. Abba, uh, you are talking <laughs> of a renowned lawyer. You know, but uh, let's, let's start from this. And I would like to deviate slightly from my good brother, uh, Dr. Alidu, that uh, he would have wished that this whole exercise would have focused on an impact assessment of the policies of the MPP. I disagree slightly with him because what Imani did, even though as uh, retreated by Honorable Obi and why something that they've been doing mm -hmm. over the years, but I think the timing is important, especially in our dispensation. In what dispensation? Because if you look at the executive summary of Imani's work, they make the point that the MPP won an election in 2016 on a marriage of what? Promises. In fact, 500 and what? 10. 510 <laughs> promises. But that wouldn't be peculiar to NPP, I mean. No, but. Because Abana, executive governments have come in. Abana, you agree with me that 2016 was a unique election. It was a unique election. Unique election in the sense that the MPP made a lot of promises. There's no doubt about it. 510. And not just promises, but audacious promises. Yeah. Promises from free SHS, uh, one district, one factory, <laughs> one village, one dam. I mean, at the end of the day, those were promises. And if you look at the executive summary, Mani says that, look, those times they were able to what? Win an unprecedented what? Election. That's in true. The but just court. to yes. add to it, you do know that in 2016, yes. Imani did That's the same good. for the Mahama administration. And they assessed that government in respect of 540 promises. Yes. So really and truly, if we're comparing, agreed. then that agreed. was probably agreed. even agreed. higher than... Yes. Agreed. Agreed. But I'm making reference to what Imani is saying informed mm -hmm. the study. In every scientific study that you engage in, there should be a problem. What is the problem? They are saying that the problem that informed this study is because the NPP made a lot of promises. And those promises were one that gave them the opportunity to win an unprecedented elections. So they want to get a reality check to find out whether promise A has been fulfilled or not. And I don't find anything wrong with it. Because most often, parties come into office on the wheels of what promises. They get into office and the story or the narrative is different. We've seen it with so many different guys. You can start from Ofo in terms of size of government. He said, look, he didn't know that that was how government was. You know. So if today Imani is saying that, look, let's do a reality check, just a checklist. You promise one, one village, one dam. Have you executed it or not? You promise free SHS. Have you executed it or not? If it is executed, you are given what? One, which is 100%. If it is not executed, you are given zero, which is what? Zero percent. If it is partially executed, you are given a certain figure. That is where I have a little bit of what? A problem. Because take something like one village, one dam. How do you rate one village, one, uh, one village, one dam? 
You can't tell me that they haven't done anything when it comes to One Village, One Down. They've done something. But how do you say that whether they wanted to do 200 dams and they've done just one, they should be given a rating of what? Partial fulfillment. Because if you look at the methodology that they used, after all this, they come to codify it. Mm -hmm. It's like a liquid scale. One, two, three, four, five. So based on that, you come to what? Codify it, then you strike an average. Right. So even the 48.7 percent becomes a little bit what? Confusing. You get a point. It becomes a little bit confusing because we are looking at average. We are looking at three, three. Uh, 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 what do they call it? Scales. One, partial, and what? And zero. So if you have a lot of partials, and you aggregate it, and you find what? An average. You get a certain figure which might not be reflective of what is going. But that's notwithstanding. I think they've done quite an impressive job. Mm -hmm. My only worry is that uh, when you situate that within the press conference or the media encounter that uh, the president engaged in, it tells you that we are still going to have a replay of 2016. It tells you that 2016 debate is not over. <laughs> and it tells you that uh, the 2020 elections is going to be influenced mostly by what happened in 2016. Because there seems to be a subtle uh, uh, positioning of the NDC that the NPP came into power on the wheels of, quote and unquote, promises that they knew that they couldn't achieve. That they came into power. That, that sounded good in the Yes, that they knew them. that, look, they couldn't achieve them. And they gave them out because they were, I mean, mouth-watery, <laughs> and the people bought into it. But if you look at the posture of the president yesterday, the president uh, still stands by the father, look, I did not come to deceive you. I strongly believed in what I said, and I'm achieving them at a rate of 72%. At a rate of 72%. We've not been previewed with how the 72 percent was arrived at but i'm not even too much interested in whether 72 or 48 <laughs> but i think that at the end of the day uh, some body or some organizations are taking or holding government accountable mm -hmm. to its what to its promises and i believe that uh, in 2020 the narrative is going to be hinged mostly on 2016 uh, 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 debate. It, it looks like that's how it is shaping out. Mm. We are yet to hear or get a proper response from the NDC uh, when it comes to what uh, Imani has put out, uh, what uh, the president uh, is saying he's done. And I think the NDC would also have to do a scientific study of this sort, mm. uh, either to, to, to validate what Imani has done, or if possible, uh, to come out with uh, based on their own assessment, what, what government has done. But it's interesting to know that if we say 27% of 510 promises fully implemented, and now we are looking about some 120 uh, promises. But what, what, yes. what do you make quickly before yeah. we, we, we go into the yeah. Afro so What do you make of what they said that, well, they were focusing on the manifesto promises, but not what government has done outside that? So that even though there's a possibility that government has done oh, yes. some work in some other areas because yeah. it wasn't captured under their manifesto. Well, we couldn't be bothered about that. Yes, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. All they wanted to do, they had a specific objective. The objective was to take, and that's what they said, they did content analysis. They picked uh, budgets, they picked parliamentary hazards, I mean, all kinds of things. So, Abna, you said you'll be coming to TV3 10 times a week. How many times have you been here? Four times. So, you are rated what? 2.5 or whatever it is. If you didn't come at all, you are rated zero. If you came here 10 times, you are rated one. That is where I have a little bit of what? Mm, a problem, problem in terms said, of yeah. what? The rating. But I think they set out a specific objective to find out whether government has fulfilled its what? Its promises. And I can tell you this. There are some promises that the NPP put across in their manifesto that, in my estimation as an individual, I don't think that there are uh, promises that should be fulfilled. For example, take one district, one factory. Personally, I don't believe that Ghana needs a one district, one factory. That's my position. Mm. So if the NDC and the NPP 
has not fulfilled one district, one factory. Based on the Imani methodology of what? Assessment. They wouldn't get what? Mm -hmm. A one. Mm -hmm. But they're not getting a one. If they're able to put 10 factories, huge factories, that can employ so many people. On paper, they haven't achieved their what? Their campaign promise. But in principle, they've done so much in terms of what? Right. Getting people to do jobs. Sure. Can I? So, yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah. But, but, but yes, one, one other interesting thing in there had to do with the fact that they themselves acknowledged that there was a limitation with their methodology, yeah. which had to do with no, I agree. their promises themselves, yeah. that they were not smart, they were not specific, yes. they were not measurable, sure, they were sure. not attributable, realistic, yeah. and time bound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that in itself raises issues about how they are even able to. I'm not, put, before, put before some, Dr. Lady comes on that, yes. so the point is this, I'm not, uh, I'm not being too hard on Imani. I think that they've done an excellent job. Right. It's given us a window of opportunity mm -hmm. for us to assess the government, mm -hmm. not in terms of performance. Get it straight, not in terms of performance. And that's well. In terms I have of a, impact, you mean? Not yeah, in terms of impact, in yeah. terms yeah. of what they've Outfit, done. Yes. In terms of what they've so done. And that is where I even have a box. problem with Imani. Mm -hmm. When you come to page 14 of their mm -hmm. distance, they have performance of the MPP. And in governance, for instance, they put 46.21%. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. If you say governance 46.21% in terms of performance, that is not what you are looking for. You are looking at in terms of what realization. How, to what extent have you been able to what, realize what you wanted to do? So I would want the NDC as a political party to also do a serious critical assessment of the NDC's implementations of its manifesto. From 2016 up to now. You mean the NPP's the NDP, Yeah, yeah. yeah then the NDC, NDC, NDC uh -huh. won, then the NDC won based yes. on manifesto mm -hmm. promises. Sure. <laughs> That's how they came yeah. into power. And they have to do a serious check right. as to whether what the president is saying 72% in fact is the case vis-a-vis -vis what Imani is saying. Very well. Would the NDC need a scientific defense to come and say no? Definitely don't say no. They can contact us. We don't need it. 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 So basically, I think me and my brother are saying the same thing. You are simple. It's a good exercise. I agree. But you see, you have to move beyond just output based. It is critical. So they said 21.7% uh, of the places were partially fulfilled. I promise you one day you wind up. I come and dig something. Is that and partial? I go, what partial, that? partial fulfillment. What impact does it have on the life of the people? If I'm a farmer and you come and dig something half, there's no water there. What, what change does it make to my life? So if you begin to just look at output, it will box, we're talking about it, it will box politicians in the corner. Make as much promises as you can. Try and start something on all the promises. <laughs> and then you are wrong partially full, partially full. Yeah. Then what, what, how, what impact does it have right. on the life of the people? Right. So we are saying that moving, it's a good example. Sure. But moving forward, they, 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 look, they said two basic research questions. I think they can add a third. So Just done. not looking at, I think it was a done deal. The first question was, what did they promise? I think most of us, even in, in the other twenties, if you add every sport, I see one they could recite mm. what the, M the MPP had promised, mm. just <laughs> like <laughs> a ABC. <laughs> it was all over the place, right? But but fine. So <coughs> how whether they were achieved or not, fully or partially, I think we should move beyond because development is not. Right. Look, see, all these things are means. Sure. The end to development is the person. Now, look at the how does that affect fine, yeah. on the life? Sure. It's, it's very important. That's fine. But we need yeah. to be moving into the. 2020 elections and the reports by the Afrobarometer, which is saying that some 12% of Ghanaians are undecided as to which of the two dominant political parties, and here we're looking at the NPP and then the NDC, they would not, they, they don't know which of the two they'll be voting for. Then there's another 11% that think that they will not vote at all. They will not vote at all. Um, your thoughts on that, but I think we have some messages. Let me quickly uh, take these messages and then we'll take a break. When we come back, we go into the Afrobarometer matters. Um, this one is coming in from um, Olibu in Able no, Geshon, sorry, from Olibu Ablikma. He says, Good morning to you, Abner, and to your panelists, especially Honorable Joyce Power. Uh, President Nanado should keep tickling himself and laughing. It's only Ghanaian president who can set an exam for himself, mark it and grade or score himself with 72%. What output is the president referring to about, uh, he says, with his elephant family and friend size of government? I would rather score the NPP government 27.09%. Um, Mustafa Abdul Martin in Tamale says, Imani rushed in its assessment. Also, the assessment was based on what they think 
um, and failed to include the citizens. Imani is morphing into a comic tank so bad. I think if the citizens were included, um, the Akufado's government would have scored more than the 48.78%. A.U. Farouk and Tamale says, um, good morning to you all. The president's meet the press engagement was full of angry responses. The answer <laughs> he gave pertaining to the ambulances is, it says what issue cannot hold, no, cannot hold water, okay. Um, ben Doc from Michelle Camp says, it's very laughable that the president is still tickling himself and laughing. Uh, how can you grade yourself 72% when you don't have any idea what is happening on the ground? 2020, Ghanaians themselves will let him know the right scorecard. Um, good morning, TV3. If you have procured ambulances and they are not in use, what is its relevance to the country? Why can't you put the number you have in use to save lives? No wonder we ordinary Ghanaians will continue to suffer under this incompetent NPP government. You didn't add your name, but thanks for your message. Um, K. Kusi in Ejusu Bisiasa says, the president indeed demonstrated his dexterity, intellectual acumen, and his administrative prowess. The vituperative criticisms are all afterthoughts. Nana indeed deserves the right for what? Encomium. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President can tickle himself and laugh, but we Ghanaians know very well that he has failed woefully and doesn't deserve any chance whatsoever. Mr. President, start preparing yourself to hand over in 2020. That's Eugene from Wa. Let me take one more. He says, good morning, TV3. It's very funny for a candidate to write an exam and turn around and grade himself or herself for that same exam he wrote. <laughs> he has failed Ghanaians, and the survey is a true, uh, is a true uh, I believe you're saying, reflection of Ghanaians. Uh, he should accept it and prepare to hand over power come December 7th. Free SHS was not the only promise. Um, Mr. President, Clary, he says, we're well, agent from, this is from good luck in Sandema. Quite a number of messages have come to but we need to take a break. We'll take a break when we come back. We'll read a few more and then turn our attention to the Afrobarometer um, findings, um, which is saying that some 12% of respondents do not know which of the two political parties they're going to vote for if the elections were held today or tomorrow. We'll see you shortly. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Point live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and across the globe at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're moving on next to look at uh, the 2019 Afrobarometer survey findings. And uh, the CDD in the, new, in the news release dated the 9th of December 2019 indicated that um, the key findings coming out of, you know, an aspect of the findings of the 2019 Afrobarometer in whole suggests that 12% um, of Ghanaians uh, are unsure or don't know which of the two political parties, NPP and DC, they would be voting for uh, in a presidential race. Also, some 11% said they would not vote. And um, another 19% refused to answer that question. A number of other findings are also here. We'll be going through them. But quickly, <coughs> let me ask, uh, let me go to Madam Bawa. Yeah, for your thoughts on that, the 12% uh, of the respondents who said they are not sure as to which of the parties to vote for. Now, when you look at the figures or the graph that came along with this uh, report or release, it shows a certain, you know, it presents a certain picture from 2005 to 2019 where um, NDC in 2005 had 23% people declaring that yes, would vote for the NDC as against 52% declaring to vote for the NPP in 2008, 24% going for NDC and then 2000, and in that same year, 45% to the NPP. It goes all the way to 2019 where 22% um, said they would, you know, vote for the NDC and 34 said they would vote for the NPP. But then we have here the 12% who said they did not know. Your thoughts on that? Well, thank you very much. As I indicated in my earlier submissions, research, statistics, data from responsible and respectable organizations such as these ones that we are mentioning and discussing this morning have been with us for a very, very long time. Indeed, they are very, very well respected and credible reports that have come in and out over at least in the last four of the Fourth Republic, starting probably from 1992 till date. The level of uh, credibility or credence that you attach to these reports 
normally would depend on where you're seated and on what it is you're basing your outlook on. Right. Indeed, over the years, I would personally say that the Afrobarometer in particular has actually had very favorable uh, you know, results regarding a reflection on our political parties in this country. It has become one of the voices, great opinions out there when you're looking for political research and, of course, undertakings. Yes. Personally, if you look at the whole of this report, since 1999, it has actually favored the NDC. Note also that even Imani, when the NDC was in government, actually said that our manifesto was the most responsive, judging by all the manifestos that they had seen. Indeed, the one they've just done for 2019 reflects solely on what the MPP has done since it's been in office. As I indicated, whatever weight you intend to put on it will be a fable depending on where you find yourself. When you say it's favored the NDC, what does that mean? In terms of its favorability levels, when we now have a comparison in 2019, mm -hmm. saying that 12% actually are abstaining, basically they're not even sure whom they're going to vote for. Mm -hmm. But remember also... But how is that favorable that to the NDC? I'm talking about successive years. Okay. You read about the 23% who had come out openly. Mm -hmm. It is still higher than what you have today. You noted also about the 30-something percent in another year, still higher than what but we have But against the NPP, the NPP squad. And indeed, when you but look you at it... you can see the graph. That yeah. way, it's like a pendulum. Mm -hmm. It's not so high, it's not so low. And it's even more an, of an indictment, I would say, mm -hmm. on the government in power, on the NPP in particular. Because you'd expect that if you look at the graph, starting from where it took off from, that they have come down where they are today, mm -hmm. actually leaves a lot to be desired. It actually also serves to undermine the number 72 percent that his excellency gave himself yesterday first and foremost it defeats that we go back there the 72 no go away then, yeah. then, yeah. then, yeah. then, we need to then, correct this you didn't give yourself 72 percent then he did he did it no he about did. the promises no, yes no, no. Then, but the promises yes, yes. 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 but who, who is implementing the promises ah. who is at the who is at the at the epoch of all those promises who is leading the chant for those promises we do know the next thing we should be looking at is that, look, Ghanaians are terribly disillusioned. Mm. Let's not underestimate the value of hardship on the good people of Ghana. The level of unhappiness is reflected in this report. Mm. Note also that 66% have admitted that the bar of inequality is widening. We are going back to the days of the super rich against the super poor. And the so-called interventions, as you yourself would notice, when you go and say you are building a dam, the next morning, you tell us it's actually a dugout. The farmers in the catchment area themselves admit to the fact that in terms of impact, impact is zero. It is substandard performance. So look at it from that perspective. Are you here to govern as the NPP, led by the president, as against governing for the good people of Ghana? What I have come to realize about the New Patriotic Party in particular is that it is almost as if it is a song singing to do Ghanaians a favor that just because we have this feeling that we have probably, we beat the NDC in an election that they were expected to win, we probably overly burden the benefit of infrastructure. We touted our achievements in that regard. And most likely, people did not even see the outcomes in terms of the jobs mm. that these projects were supposed to deliver. Today, that deliver. now that we sing the success mm. story of Terminal 3, mm -hmm. using that as a case in point, since His Excellency himself started his submissions on that all too now popular positive effect. The people who are working there, are they your sisters and my sisters and brothers? Will we necessarily say they are NDC or MPP? They are Ghanaians. The funds that were used to invest in that project, they are taxpayers' money. I come back to the point that government is a continuum. Mm -hmm. That in some regards, you would continue from where your predecessor left off. The hospital facilities that are currently working. I go to the Ridge Hospital. I see persons there, both MPP and NDC. Are they not Ghanaians? I expect us to come to the center. Have a government that acts more responsive to the needs of the good people of Ghana. Mm. When you increase petroleum prices, and I was interested in page four of their manifesto in 2016, the list of all who are suffering are still suffering today. You heard the nurses last week. You heard not last week. You had all of these categories of persons. The fuel prices mm -hmm. that go up at the pump each morning. The electricity promises that were made. This is a book of unfulfilled promises. As we said, they touch on a little of it and think it will impact on everybody's life. But in actual fact, 
in terms of assessment, it is nil. 66% of Ghanaians clearly are totally disillusioned. 59% say that we are heading in the wrong direction. Go to Twitter and see. Even when people put up these very short, little, little, uh, you know, polls, you see the outcomes. Mm. There is no impact as far as people's lives are concerned. In terms of poverty alleviation, in terms of a better life for the good people of Ghana, people still want to see results. Note also that 41% of Ghanaians say that they want to leave the country. So take that away from the number of 66 that admits to inequality that is widening. Take that away from the 59% that admit that we are heading in the wrong direction. My sister, there is no doubt that corruption remains a canker, that corruption fuels the poverty, that corruption does not aid the poor, but rather takes away from the poor. What is the effort that this government has put in, having come into government based on promises to do better? At least everybody in Ghana is added in that in terms of the fight against corruption, very little or nothing is being done. Did we come or did we go? Good. If the song no <laughs> is for the president and the MPP mm -hmm. to continue to sing from the same pages of 2016, Ghanaians have moved on from there. Very well. I think on this note, it is clearly, and you can see along the divide, is a huge indictment on the abysmal performance mm -hmm. of the MPP. I tend to I, I, I tend and to all these promises. For, in, for, for, in fact, yesterday your, I was really surprised that there was no question even on the current attacks on the Auditor General. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, of course, even yesterday there was a comment even worsening the plight of the Auditor General. Very well. At least we know Let he's me. working to fight corruption. Thanks. The Office of the Special Prosecutor, and of course you have to give a little bit of credit, the President tried to stay away from little, that story. A little bit of credit. Yes, because he knows. <laughs> He knows that what he will suffer if he were to admit right. to those issues. Okay. But Thanks. look at the budget. <laughs> <laughs> the budget allocation even has yes. not gone. Let me move to Honorable. <laughs> Points well made. Points well made, Madam Bauer. What's that? Honorable, your response to that? Yeah. Well, the, uh, the Afro Barometer pool was conducted between September and uh -huh. October. October, yeah. So it's quite recent. And their findings show that. For the president, he's still very popular as compared to um, what he found during President Muhammad's time. The people of Ghana trust the president more than any other time. It the sense that Barovita is showing that if there are three institutions that you should trust, is the president, the army, and um, religious leaders. And for the president to score 58%, it shows that the president is so very popular and they trust the president. Even when it came to parties, comparing MPP with minority parties, including the NDC, MPP scores 49% as against 37 of all the opposition parties put together, of course, led by the NDC. So, as far as I'm concerned, what is very critical is to get those who say that they are undecided or sitting on the fence to come on board. Mm. We are 34. We are ahead of those who are 22 and still jubilating that they are 22. At our 34, our aim is to make sure that we move higher than that. After all, in the last elections, the president had 53. At the beginning of his term, people had so much hope. Now, if the latest um, pool is showing that a lot are sitting back, it's, it's a matter of convincing this lot to come on board. And one of the areas we've identified is the fact that we've done so much, but probably we are not marketing it well. Probably we are not articulating it for the average person to know that sticking to the MP, MPP, immediate, medium, and long term, is the best option. Because if you look at all the figures that have come out, NDC is not an option for the average person. And these are the figures. Still Going for wrong direction, you look at 2014, mm -hmm. those who said that the country was going in the wrong direction. 85 good percent. 2019 is 59%. So it's not just that people have just woken up and they say that hey, MPP is so bad, <coughs> it's the evil party, so 59 says it's going in the wrong direction. If you look at 2014, 85 good percent. That's fine, but Honorable, let's, look at, let's now look, look at, at this. the economy. Yeah, the econ yes, I mean, we, we, all those things, yes. But we're looking at the release th that was issued this week, right? Which yes. is looking at what the respondents are saying in terms of whether they will vote yes, for that's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's right. But I just yeah. want us to focus on 
your, the a point here, which is yeah. a graph here, which is looking at the trend from 20, 2005 to 2019, yeah. relative to, I mean, people's position mm. Mm. as to which of the parties, which of the two they would vote for. Yes. And I'm saying that because you're talking about the 22% of the NDC as against the 34. Yes. So we're looking at how we have come, the trajectory. If, mm. you, if you look at it, I mean, it, start, it, it's, it it's jumps at me, the, yeah. the, the graph here, that from 2005 to 2019, <coughs> mm -hmm. The NPP started with... Um, 2005. Like 2005, yes. President Kufuor Yes. Yes. So there was a 52%, you know, declaration mm. that, yes, we are voting for the NPP. Yes. And then it came to 45 in 2008, then 36 in 2012, 36 in 2014, mm -hmm. 49 in 2017, and then 34 in 2019. So there's that decline. Oh, you're if you look them at... together. Sorry? <laughs> because you're putting them together. Some of the years are not the NPP's years. No, no, no. But there's still that comparison that who yeah. would you vote for? Yes. But I'm just saying mm -hmm. that look at the trend from 52 in 2005 to 34 in 2019. Yes. Let's look at the NDC's performance. 23% in 205, 24 in 208, mm -hmm. 30 in 2012, then 23 in 2014, 22 in 2017, and still 22 in 2019. If yeah. you look at it, yes, the NPP has a higher value, yeah. but there's that decline. Whereas NPP maintains a lower value, Consistently as against NPP, but it's still there, uh -huh. the same, 22. Uh -huh. You don't see it declining necessarily. Yes. Do you know what I mean? So as, as NPP, what are you, or what do you make of this, and what is that's, the way forward for the party? Yeah, that's what I've said. If you look at um, what appear to be the priority for the average person uh -huh. during the NDC time, it was about energy, education, and jobs. Now if you look at what is the priority for the average person as at now. Energy doesn't fall in the first three. So they think that that issue has been addressed. Okay. Education doesn't fall in the first three because they think that we are addressing education. Jobs, they think that economic management, it used to be the number one issue for Ghanaians, but now it doesn't fall in the first three. So that shows that what they thought were the major issues, MPP is addressing them. Except that, of course, nobody can pretend that we are in a paradise now. And nobody can pretend that within three years, then people can solve all the problems of the average person. That, that would be living in a dreamland. What is most critical is the fact that this is what we have achieved. This is what we want you to know. But in spite this of why that, there's are. this decline. Yeah. Shouldn't that be worrying? It's, it's worrying in the sense that, as I said, those sitting on the fence, mm. we still need to do a lot of work to bring them on board. Mm. But comparing us to the NDC, the NDC is not better than us. Every aspect, if you look at the Afrobarometer, we are not saying it. If we were saying it, we would say that it's cooked mm. or choreographed. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what Afrobarometer is saying. Mm. Getting it from the people and comparing us to NDC, we are still far ahead of them. Except that we, they, they are not our benchmark. It's the people who vote for us. It's the people that we have to satisfy. Mm. And what we've been able to do so far, we have to convince the people. That to get, to indeed, get the 15 back. Yes, to get yes. a 15 back. But, so, but, 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 okay. Oh, I thought you, you've had enough. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you gave all the statistics. The NDC if you look at the graph. has won more elections if in you the look at Abna, than the MPP. Abna, if you look at so the graph, not in doubt. if you look at the graph, uh -huh. region by region, yes. if we are eating into their region. No, 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 no. It even says, in fact, that is another it's thing. That's eight against eight. Yes, eight. It's, eight. 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 it's right in the middle. No, it's eight, eight. No, no, no. The weightings no, no, are different, no. yes. but the number exactly. is so no, eight. No, eight. Eight. no, no, no. You don't understand me. It's not that they have eight regions. The demographics are different. It's not that they have eight regions, we have eight regions. We have our traditional regions. Right. And, and I'm saying that... Oh, you're eating into their territory. Yes. The, 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 look, the look at... Look at um, no, north. Oh. Why? Oh. Oh. No, <laughs> well, that's my... It's not in, 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 in all the northern not, regions, you are not doing well. My, my right. In the yes. region, we have 47. In all of them. The region, we have 47. The region, we 33. In all of them. Yeah. In all of them. Yeah. Well. Apart from national language where we are leading you. In Take all, the regions. In all of them. Populous regions, no. including Greater Accra. Uh -huh. We are ahead of you. You've qualified it. Of well, course, that's where you get the most. We've had enough uh -huh. on this side. Of course, that's where you get the most. So you do know side. And that you are in a very precarious position. You work on it. Thank you. Work on it. As you have the last hour. Allah brought you to the West Wing. Let me go to the West Wing. There are only dreams. They are right here beside you. Your thoughts on this? I mean, see. I'm not. 
do you have the benefit of this? Yes, I do. I do. Yes, yes. Speak to that. Uh, yes. I think uh, first of all, it's interesting, if not uh, not surprising, though, that when we have polls, politicians will always cherry pick. Oh yeah. And the interpretation is different. Interpret it yeah. when it's used. That, Legitimately yeah. so. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the irony here is that even yeah, though watch, I'm not supposed to hold such a position by virtue of my profession, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. a little bit very skeptical when it comes to polling, mm -hmm. especially political polling in Ghana. Because uh, the Ghanaian <coughs> is not very, very honest when it comes to, I mean, coming out with uh, his intentions in terms of which political party he will vote for. And I believe that the position that I hold is validated by the graph that you, you have in front of you. And if you don't mind, we can go back to it. Mm -hmm. 2005, what does the poll say? Mm -hmm. NDC, 23%, NPP, 52%. Mm -hmm. What it meant was that if election was conducted at that time, mm -hmm. plus or minus three, that is the margin of error, mm -hmm. NPP should have had 52%. Mind you, 2005 was when Kofor had won the second term. So he was very, very popular. Yeah. So you can say that if election was held at that time, Kofu could have won. What is interesting is 2008, NDC, NPP had what? 45%. Mm -hmm. NDC, 24%. Who won in 2008? Mm -hmm. Mills. Mills won in 2008, if you remember. Mm -hmm. But the projection was what? Oh, NPP, NPP was going mm -hmm. to double, if not, I mean, 45 to 2012. Very, very interesting. You remember 2012? Mm -hmm. During the demise of uh, Professor Mills. Yep. MPP 36, NDC 30, okay. different six. Who won? NDC. NDC won. 2014, MPP 36, NDC 23. 2014. Then we had elections in what? 2016. Mm -hmm. That, if you look at the difference, it confirms what happened in what? 2000 what? 16. Mm -hmm. The point that I'm trying to make here is that at the end of the day, even though I'm a little bit skeptical when it comes to polling of this sort, mm -hmm. every political party serious of a sort mm -hmm. will, we'll do it will, yeah. will do its own interpretation and look at it and try as much as possible to take some cue yeah. out of it. Mm -hmm. What we are seeing today, and I think that to a reasonable extent is valid because if you look at 2017, 49, 22%, double. 2017 was when Anado had just won elections. Double, actually. Yeah, he had just won election, yeah. a huge margin. Mm -hmm. He had come into office 2017, euphoria. In fact, some MDC people self <laughs> would, have drifted, <laughs> would have drifted to what? Yeah. To him. Today, the reality has dawned on us as what Ghanaians. I want to say the reality has dawned on us as Ghanaians that this difference between a political leader who is in opposition and what a person in what in government. And that is why I always say that this Imani exercise that was conducted, no matter how you look at it, is of importance and of what relevance in terms of our forward march as a people. Because there's one thing to promise, then there's another thing to what? To deliver. To deliver. And this polling goes to affirm that kind of uh, 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 observation, so to speak. Because 2017, Anado was very, very popular. And 2019, he's what? He's come down by, what, 15 points. What is interesting for me is, <laughs> even though he's come down, which I believe it should be, because the reality has done on us. I mean, one village, one dam, uh, one district, one factory, one this, one that, and all those things. What interests me is that the NDC is not moving. 22%. Why is it the case? But they've this, come down. No, they haven't. 22%. 2017. 2017. 22. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, No, 2014, they were 23. Mm -hmm. No, 2014, they were 23. Mm -hmm. So, 2014, when they lost the election in 2016, they, they came to 22. 22. They've still been. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. no, even that one is understandable. Mm -hmm. 20, 2014, 23, 2017, they were 22. Mm -hmm. So, if they are not moving, there should be what? A reason. A reason. And, and I believe the reason is, one, they still have their base. 
family in our corner. <laughs> they so still have their base, mm -hmm. which is even 2017, notwithstanding the defeats. The base have been there, and the base continues to be loyal. Mm -hmm. Now, Abna, of this whole thing, there's a certain huge margin of undecided. People, undecided. Yes. Yep. <coughs> how, do you, how do you poach them? Yep. How do you what? Poach them. That would be the issue and should be the issue of what? Concern for the yep. two political parties. Mm -hmm. But I believe that 2020 moving forward, looks like the narrative has already been what? Been shaped. Uh, in the sense that uh, 2020, as I said, uh, even though my sister Joyce Bauer believes that uh, it's not going to be a rehash of 2016, but I think 2016 will still have a major role to play yeah. when it comes to uh, 2020. 20, in the sense that, look, the two individuals, the former president and the current president, do have a track record. Mm. <laughs> they have a track record to speak to. Traditionally, it's always been when you have a certain president contesting a referendum on him. But this is the first time that we have a former president right. contesting, contesting a certain well. president. Sure. So, your track record Against and me. my track record, mm. just if suppose that was... Against PSHS. If you say but, so, but I didn't say that. I didn't, 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 I
the, the particular years in between. exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I, I agree with you that if you're just going to focus on maybe doing the survey maybe a year after a popular electoral victory, mm -hmm. people are more likely going to still repose confidence in the winning candidate and right. in the winning party than when you look at the years in between. So I think the years in between play the crucial that mm -hmm. they make the determination and then the differences. Mm. But I just want to come back to the forty two percent who said no. The forty-two percent didn't say they won't vote. Oh, sorry, I think it's if you break it down, eleven percent who said they won't vote. Eleven percent are ele undecided. No. Eleven percent said they don't know who to vote. Right? Yeah. It's not that they won't vote; they don't know. They don't know mm -hmm. who to vote for. Yes, and then nineteen percent said nineteen percent didn't answer. Vote. They don't. Yes. They will not answer. Okay. Mm, yes. Nineteen refused to answer. Nineteen didn't yes. answer. Twelve don't know. They Twelve don't. Know. Eleven will not yes. vote. So I think I think that is significant. So eleven, yeah. mm -hmm. eleven will not mm -hmm. vote. Mm -hmm. 12 don't know who to vote mm -hmm. for, and 19 will not disclose. Mm -hmm. That's about 40 something. That, that's 42. Yeah. That, that's why I said 42. If, okay, you can break that. But them is down. it okay to put it together that way? It's, it's, it's not okay it's to not, put them. Yeah. There are different things totally. altogether. You see, people totally. who say, I will not answer, maybe they should have pulled further. Mm -hmm. So, I will not answer means that I have a candidate, mm -hmm. though I won't tell you who I'm going to vote for. If people begin to say that, maybe they had a candidate they had so much trust in, and then maybe the trust was waning. waning. So, maybe they are not willing to disclose. Right then, the the what's the name? The eleven percent who said they don't know who to vote for. I don't know whether they think all these two parties would are doing vote. so 11 well. Eleven don't know, don't would not vote. Would not vote. No. Okay, I'm not talking. About, I said those who don't know who to vote That's for. That's twelve percent. That's twelve. I'm not sure whether these parties are doing so well or they are not doing so well. That's why they are still undecided. And then the eleven percent is actually the upper team. Mm. But what is more interesting to me is the demographics. If you if you go further, you see that. Uh, what's the name? 17%. That is inclination of those who said, uh, those who said they were not, uh, what's the name? The inclination to vote, sorry, not to vote, was highest among the educated. Right. 17%. And when you tend to look at the educated, people usually classify them among the rational voter population. They are not just, they may have traditional party support, but usually they look at the policies, how good the policies are, and the capacity of the one making the policies to deliver it, but also the impact of the policy, mm. largely maybe on their businesses, but collectively mm. on, the, on the level of development at the state. So these people say that they will not vote, compared to 6% of those who, who, who are not educated. Mm -hmm. Then when you, when you go down, 15% of those who said they wouldn't vote, I think most of them are urban dwellers, compared to 7%. Of a rural. Looking at the, the conditions of living in the urban areas, it's very it's telling of people's, uh, what's the name, ability to decide that things are not going well for me against things are going well for me. So if, if you, and then, what's the name, 14% of young people between the age of 18 to 35 are also part of those who, who said they will not vote. Mm -hmm. and, and we know the percentage of the youth, even in our register alone, electoral register, and collectively the broader population of right. Ghana. So when you begin to, to look at these things, it is very important that political parties take advantage of this particular these findings, data yeah. and be able to see how they can mm. convincingly talk to these people to come on board. One thing that when we do all these predictions and uh, uh, ways and means in our election campaign, we, sorry, we can do all this, but we are not able to predict voter turnout, which is very important. Turnout can destabilize every political sure. party strategy. So we should be very careful about, sorry, not even careful, take decisive strategy and steps to be able to attract this. But if you ask me, why, why are people not saying they will vote? Broadly, research have shown that now people, Ghanaians are more descending. Two, some people even think the NDC and the MPP are the same. There's no difference between them. People think politicians are self-centered. There have been a lot of failed promises. The jobs that people promised them, they haven't been able to deliver. So, broadly, people think that when we vote for politicians, they come and they think about themselves, not we the people. So, well, it is important to stay at home <laughs> rather than waste my time and go and kill and then mm. vote. But put it together, I think the NDC, the MPP as a government should be, we all know elections are it's a census on the incumbent. But I think given the relatively 72%, the high 72% that the president scored himself, I don't think they should have been falling down the way they are falling. No, but, uh, in the, in we the, need to correct this. Mm -hmm. Then it wasn't the president's correct. <laughs> <laughs> the president said it. No, we need to correct it. They uh -huh. said that Imani uh -huh. has put <coughs> at your campaign promises. Yeah. And Imani has put you at 48%. The president said, we have also done our own 
analysis on so the I'm, promises. I'm saying that 70, and it's 72 percent. 72 percent. So he didn't score leads. himself. So, so I'm I saying if the MPP is doing 72 so performance yes. rate, yes. Yes. Okay. then they, we shouldn't be seeing the job exactly. that's, that's okay with. It's very simple. It, well. it, it, doesn't, it doesn't correlate kind of thing. And but it doesn't, it doesn't also mean that what the president is saying is not factual. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying what the president says. Well. That that's not what I'm saying. I'm sure but I was thinking that if you are doing so well... That on CPI, I think in 2014, then. Imani scored President Muhammad then at uh, 50 something percent well, if you remember yeah. Yes. So, I think, yeah. so, but that was yeah. in the fourth year, in the fourth year yeah. but this is the third year exactly. so people have raised issues yeah. about yeah. maybe yes. if you give the, this government another year it could up its ante or something. Something. especially when the government is well. just pegging its whole success on what his predecessor did that he condemned them then you start well, that's, to your, that's your opinion okay. anyway well, but now quickly before we move on to look at the unpass between the EC and then the opposition parties quickly let's look at government's performance regarding the fight against corruption. The, the, I think the question was posed to the president. I don't know if we have uh, um, um, the, the, the tape we could play the response, but essentially looking at prosecutions that have happened following the setting up of the office of the special prosecutor. Mm -hmm. The president responded. Some have said, well, it's not necessarily you know, satisfactory, the response we got saying that, well, the office, the, the special it's prosecutor is, is independent and he's yeah. working. But some people have raised issues about the fact that currently the OSP is working on just two cases. He said that himself, two cases. And what's worrying as well or what's interesting for us is also the fact that less than 25% of the budgeted 180 million Ghana cities has been dispersed to the office of the special prosecutor. So the question is, how is he to work if he has, you know, uh, issues with, with, with funding or resources. But we need to take a break. When we come back, we do a quick discussion on um, the Office of Special Prosecutor. But I'm told we have the, the, the president's response ready. So let's take a listen to that, and then we go into our break and return. The instructions have gone from me to everybody in my government that they have to cooperate with the Special Prosecutor. Um, he made these statements some time ago. I haven't had them repeated recently. And I'm assuming from that, therefore, that the directive that I gave of cooperation uh, is working. But I've made it clear to the special prosecutor that if ever there are some kinds of obstacles or barriers that I can help jump and overcome, of course, I'm, willing, I'm ready and willing to do so. I've not had an opportunity to discuss anything with him in the last few months. I know he's doing his work. He's supposed to be an independent person. He is an independent uh, official. And I, I, I'm reluctant to be attempting to micromanage or get involved or be seen to be meddling in, in his remit. He's a very experienced public official. He's getting on with his work. And all of us will be judges of the quality of that work. So that is what I would say. And it means that, uh, do I say I'm happy or unhappy with his work? He's going on with his work. That's all I can say. Um, okay, so the president there um, answering the question in respect of the performance of the special prosecutor. He says, well, he's carrying on with his work. Um, yeah. I'll turn to... <laughs> yeah. I'll it's for the people to, to judge. I, yeah, it's for the people to judge. But yes, so the people... Uh, I'm, I'm turning to one of the people here, who's Dr. Dinapo. What, what, what do you make of that? <laughs> what do you make of that response? I'm not, the truth is that uh, corruption has always been an issue uh, in our Ghanaian elections. I mean, starting from Rawlings, uh, Kofu, uh, Professor Mills, uh, President Mahama, and today. In fact, I believe that corruption was one of the most important and attractive variables that was, I mean, used as a basis for which the NPP came into power. Mm -hmm. And legitimately so, because if you look at the track record of the president, like him or hate him, uh, you couldn't have said that uh, he's somebody who is corrupt. And most, this issue of the special prosecutor, which is the subject of discussion, was so attractive to the Ghanaian. And if you look at the president's rating, when Martin Amidu was made the special prosecutor, it went very, very high. But the truth of the matter is that 
we need to say it as it is. There's a high level of what? Disappointment. Even among MPP members, when it comes to the office of the special prosecutor. Mm -hmm. I have said time and time and again that the special prosecutor has been whining too much. Hmm. And uh, hasn't I've, he been whining for good reason? <laughs> well, I've, I've said he's been whining too much. Mm. I do not think the office of the special prosecutor or the special prosecutor as a person should be seen as a panacea in fighting corruption mm -hmm. in this country. It's impossible. There needs to be commitment on the part of government. And most importantly, I think there needs to be commitment on the part of we ourselves. Ghanaians, I believe, are hypocrites when it comes to the fight against corruption. Why do I say this? I'm not. Obi Wan sitting here. He's an MP. How much is his salary? He goes home, there's so many people lined up asking for what? Money for school fees, money to go and marry again, money to do wedding, money to do all kinds of things. Where are you, where is he getting the money from? Where do you expect him to get the money from? If he's giving you the money, why do you expect him not to be corrupt? So, we have, well, no. That, no, that's fine. But so, yes. like you said, corruption was one of the main issues in the 2016 elections, which led to the promise that is, of the yeah. setting up of the OSP. Now the yeah. OSP is here. OSP is here. Issues about resources and issue. And now he's, he said that he's handling currently two issues, two cases. And people I find said that, that the office of the special prosecutor is a disappointment. Very well. It's simple yeah. as that. Okay, great. So There's I'm, no doubt about it. Madam Bauer, let me hear from you on that quickly so that we can move to the EC issues. Well, government led by President Akufuado has willed for Ufu in its fight against corruption. Mm. That is not in doubt. I believe that all the indices, Transparency International, uh, the Anti-Corruption Integrity... Ghana Integrity Initiative. Yes, Ghana Integrity Initiative. All of them have spoken at length. Indeed, I listened to His Excellency the President condemn uh, foreign bodies in this country for meddling in our activities because they've spoken loudly about corruption. That Note that they are Udonis. They have every reason to be concerned about audit reports that come out unfavorably <laughs> regarding how donor funds are being utilized or expended. Uh -huh. Indeed, they talk about family and friends. Cronyism is a part of corruption because you cannot critic, critic or basically even criticize or challenge your cronies if you bring them into government to support your efforts. Indeed, when it comes to corruption, I think it is at the lowest ebb mm. that the Office of the Special Prosecutor on its own, Siomoto, will be unable to deliver as promised. Because first and foremost, I do think that a lot of criticism was attached to the comments recently by the Special Prosecutor himself. He has since decided not to further comment publicly <laughs> about his issues. Indeed, <coughs> I heard also the Auditor General, who was attempted to go public and comment publicly on his work and the difficulties facing him as an individual leading an anti-corruption agency receive enormous condemnation, <laughs> largely from the persons in government. So indeed, when you take one arm and offer a branch to persons that you are attempting to fight corruption, in the same vein, you refuse to advance the budgetary allocations okay. for them to do the work that they are targeted to do. It obviously shows that there is really no commitment to fighting corruption. Okay, well, when so many of your family and friends in terms of running a government that has so many cronies in it, certainly you cannot be seen to be fighting corruption effectively. I think that let's admit that corruption is at its lowest, that very little is being done, that indeed many challenges, including one of the corruption agencies themselves, led by the procurement authority, nothing has been heard so far about what has been done to the individual who resigned or was suspended, suspended because of anyway. breaches yeah. in procedure. And many of these procedural breaches have come up for discussion. The National Youth Employment Agency, we're still waiting. Huge sums of money have been dissipated, and so far nothing is being done. When you read the dictionary, there's a good reason why they define cronism, they define family and friends. It is all part of the perception that feeds into corruption. Thank you. A lot of the time, the conversations we had even in the past, yeah. you would realize that they actually pale in comparison to what is being done today. Very You've well. heard about the spat between the senior minister himself and the auditor general. Is that not a way to gag an individual who wants to fight corruption? Well, Government I mean, must show well, clear that direction and commitment. That, that, well, uh, yeah, again, it depends on who, 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 is very rich. <laughs> <laughs> who is speaking. But as well, to whether heard, that is to I gag heard, the auditor general, I, I, I need to have a take on this. But we, we definitely come back. <laughs> yes. When we come back, you and Dr. Ali Duseidu would have your bites on this, and then we move straight into the well, EC and the biometric voter registration matters. See you shortly.
and listening to The Key Points live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're wrapping up on the conversation um, about uh, the Afrobarometer uh, survey of 2019, along with um, the Imani reports and the president's, you know, um, meet the press yesterday. Currently, we are focusing on his response in respect of um, corruption, particularly looking at the setting up of the office of the special prosecutor and the performance of that special prosecutor. I'll be going to Honorable Obi Amwa and Dr. Ali Duseidu for their perspectives on that. But before then, let me quickly read some uh, messages that have come through uh, from our viewers and listeners. Uh, this one says, um, uh, Good morning, TV3. Uh, the president should just accept the Imani scores and stop making noise. The president knows very well that his performance is too abysmal. How can he score himself? In uh, he says every football match there is a referee who determines the scores of the game. Abner, this is the, is the president saying promises, dreams yet to be initiated, and those at various stages of completion all form all form part of the past mark. And did I hear him say he had only two relatives and friends in his government? Or maybe he has disowned them. Please help me understand. That's Tim Kran from Medina. Um, Koshi Bado, who are you for Indenu, says, and the president places the fear of lamentations over human life. What thinking went into this decision? And he contradicted himself by saying at the end of his presentation that all roads can't be done at a go. The ambulances must be launched in line with the showmanship character of his leadership. That's sad. Um, this one also says, good morning, thank you for the discussion. I wish to say that our politicians should know that impact is important, but they also focus on quantity by promising a lot. The average Ghanaian will also want to see how many of the campaign promises are achieved, not <coughs> necessarily their impact. I believe that what inf that's what informed Imani's line of questions. Um, good morning, TV3. I was so disheartened when the president said he, was not, he has not regretted appointing 125 ministers for a small country like Ghana. The president has failed the people of Ghana. The arrogance is too much. The family and friends in the government mm -hmm. has culminated uh, into high levels of corruption in the country. Uh, it says the NPP will lose miserably in 2020 election. Let me take the last one from here and, and then return to the panelists. Good morning, TV3. Please, for... My point, from my point of view, let's look into what Mr. Seydou is saying. That's Dr. Seydou. I think that can help us all as Ghanaians. That's Moses from Takwadi. I'm not sure exactly which of the submissions uh, you are referring to with respect to Dr. Seydou. But anyways, thanks for that. There's a number of messages here, but we will need to, you know, return to the panelists for their perspectives as well. So please, Honorable uh, and um, Dr. Seydou, I'll just give you, well, thank you so much. 30 seconds, 30 seconds, so we can go on to the EC issues, well, well, please. Thank you so much. Um, if you look at the Afrobarometer survey, of course, there are those that they've categorized into institutions, whether the institutions are doing when it comes to corruption. And then the rural government itself is playing in addressing some of these issues. Um, if you listen to the president very well, we promised to set up an independent office of special prosecutor. And as far as the president is concerned, as far as we all are aware, the Office of Special Prosecutor is independent. Indeed, I can tell you on record that he's investigating government officials and nobody has stopped him. There are district chief executives who are being investigated every day by the, the Special Prosecutor. And the government has not said anything or interfered in what they are doing or gone to uh, ask him to stop. What he's complaining is that some of the officials is... Uh, you mean, not cooperate with him? No, not cooperation. That some of the officials that he is investigating, um, they should be kicked out of office, which, which, which is his op opinion anyway. Because if you are investigating him and haven't found anything against him, and he's not interfering with what you're doing, it's, for you to say that you, you should stay out of office before you can do it, it's another matter. But I'm saying that chief executives outside Accra here, all the way from Upper West, Upper East, they are under investigation by the Office of Special Prosecutor. And as the President said, he is independent as to whether his doings work well or not. It's not for the President to judge. It's for the average person to judge. If you're talking about resources, last year he had all that he needed to be able to run the office. And if you look at even the Act, the Parliament was so specific that even the President doesn't have the power to appoint the, the, the chairperson. Members are put on the board, and they choose their own chairperson. That's how come 
the chairperson of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, is the board chair, to give that kind of independence. So, but at the end of the day, as a government, you can't hurry anybody to prosecute people, especially when the person is independent. He no, has to come out with what he has found and what he thinks uh, we should move but, forward uh, uh, when prosecution Doc comes earlier on mentioned that um, uh, Mr. Martin Amidu has been whining in his perspective, but, I, uh, you know, he's been lamenting actually about resources <coughs> or the lack of resources. That's what I'm seeing. And that. there was a budgeted sum of $180 million. Recently, we heard that it's just about less than, in fact, I think 20% That's what I'm seeing that has been disbursed. One, we, one, Obviously, that would affect him. One, since the office was set up, everything that they need to be able to function as at the end of last year, has been provided. Two, as at maybe September, if he's talking about these figures, the releases will go. And he has not come to say Did that. Now in the, I mean, the last, when the last No, I'm saying that month. the figure that he gave was mm. way before when the budget was even uh, submitted. But I'm saying that, is he saying that it's because, what, because the issues he raised are something like, I need 10, I need 50 people to be able mm -hmm. to do the work. You've given him only 20. That's even the 20 that has been given to him. You can't use it to do the work. Is that what he's saying? We, we, I, some of us are very careful in doing anything that will yeah. get the impression that we are criticizing that office. I'm <laughs> saying, as far as we are concerned, <laughs> the, the office is independent enough. The car office car has enough, enough <laughs> resources to be able to work. Yeah. And if this is how they are working, it's for the people of Ghana to judge. Very well. Let me come to you, um, Doc, here. And I mean, one of the issues he's also had to complain about has to do with the parallel systems and the fact that there are overlaps here and there. Today, CID is looking into something. He's also looking into a whole lot of issues. Even we can have the recent issue about the Auditor General, <coughs> where we have currently the matter pending before the court to determine whether Ioko is the one to do that or, you know, the Office of Special Prosecutor. So those, you know, systemic challenges are there as well. That, 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 that was the, quickly. one of the issues that uh, I really wanted to refer to. We, we, all, we cannot underestimate the rule of corruption, even in the success of, sorry, the victory of the MPP in 2016. So it's very important. But now, I, I agree to Honorable that the uh, Office of the Special Prosecutor is an independent institution, theoretical or in the Constitution. It's to be. No, it's not in, in, uh, but practice. in practice, yes. governance itself is, is, is interdependent. Yes. You cannot just completely separate institutions right. in practice. So the work of the special prosecutor is affected by the level of cooperation he gets from other state institutions. So it is very important. One, apart from the, the overlap, who is supposed to investigate what, and at what time is which person investigating what? The Office of Special, special Prosecutor is picking up a case, or a case is under its investigation, then the CID has collected that person. You know, those kind of things, it's, it's serious impediment. It's, still continuing. It's, it's a serious impediment to his work. So I believe he, there's, there's, it's a synergy kind of relationship. But if you don't get cooperation from the other stakeholders, it's definitely going to be very difficult for you. So if you ask me, I think the Office of the Special Prosecutor has performed below the expectation of many Ghanaians. Mm. We thought that given the, the serious nature of this issue, and the way the president, the president actually took it seriously by establishing this It was this one office. of the quickest. The first thing. Has Bill yes. Under so I, I think that, that you see, the issue of corruption and corruptibility was very high in 2016. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was just a sitting president with a track record and somebody who wanted to be a president. Mm -hmm. So now, if the office of the special prosecutor is not doing so much, all these issues will come back to the doorstep of the president. So I think he should, like, whatever things that he, he needs to be able to do it, the government should, should give the support but, to him. Um, right. but, <laughs> but, well, we need we, to move on to okay, uh -huh. But don't you think that this office of the special prosecutor is also overhyped? Ah, well, I mean, you, I mean, you, you say that all the time. are putting everything yeah. on this. There are other agencies what that are yes, fight corruption. Exactly. But yeah. I mean, Should to I the extent so that there, it was a campaign of and yeah, actually has yeah, been, yeah, and I'm sure it was, the passage resources. of the bill led to the 48.78% in the money. Otherwise, I'm sure it would have been lower because they ticked the box. But anyway, the independent body has been set up as even the government or part, the president should control that body. It was the head that followed the creation. But I'm less than one minute. But I'm not going to and and don't and forget that the NPP actually rode on the back of this individual yes. to come into power. Very no, well. Using that no. as, there, there was as, 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 as a people's power point. For the same <laughs> people who say that we have gone to appoint an NPP person <laughs> to head an <laughs> NPP. <laughs> The same people say, win, you can win this one. This one you can In fact, at one time, a, <laughs> a waiting 
<laughs> vice president. <laughs> so he tells me that he's not a vice president. He was a political vice president. And he was nothing to do with the people. He's a vice president. He's a prosecutor MPP. I'm level one. Thank you. You haven't answered that question. I have not opened a cab of words. Thank you very much. It had nothing to do with fighting corruption. Thank you very much. And with propaganda. Thank you very much. It had nothing to do with fighting corruption. Shall we move on, please? You said you're saying that. It had nothing to do with fighting corruption. He doesn't want to do prosecution. Thank you. Honorable. Honorable, were you at the IPAC meeting? Yes. Were you there at the IPAC meeting? I wasn't. But you, you, you do attend IPAC meetings very well. So now, this week, we we heard news broke about the fact that some opposition parties led by the NDC actually staged a walkout of an IPAC meeting. I think we have the video of that. Let's take a quick look at that and then come to the panel for their perspectives on that to note that that consultant had been brought in in 2011 to advise the Electoral Commission when the decision was taken to go biometric. And we invited him here for 10 days and he did an audit, an extensive audit of our systems and indeed confirmed that our systems were not robust, they were obsolete, technology had evolved since 2011 when the EC first adopted biometric technology and he was of the view that Rather than stay with one vendor, it was important to open up our processes to invite a variety of vendors. The four shortlisted hardware vendors, namely Miru Systems Company Limited, Backpress Limited, Smartmatic International, and Thales Digital Identity Solution, to demonstrate their ability to provide a more robust and credible system. The whole exercise is to, of the commission is in the spirit of transparency. You see in the room that a variety of stakeholders are here, not only the political parties, but some of our development partners and members of civil society. We felt that in the spirit of transparency and accountability, it was important to have an inclusive process that will go beyond just the EC or just between the EC and the political parties, but to cover the society. Be blunt. There is deceit and deception about the way this EC is behaving. Do you see how snakes behave? Very, very deceptive, very subtle. You call us to come and come and be part of a process. It's an evaluation process. Do you have the technical means to do evaluation? We don't. The NDC noted it questioned the EC on its inability to fix the current system deployed and managed by STL. The EC insisted the cost of fixing it would be more expensive than acquiring a new one. They are ever asked to be furnished with documents as well as the audit report conducted by the independent IT consultant, but the EC has been unable to furnish it with them. Whilst the EC is saying they need to procure a new system, we are saying that based on our analysis, based on what we know, it can be upgraded and we can even have better results. And then they said it's going to cost more to upgrade than to get a new one. We said, okay, so let us know the cost of the upgrading that you said will cost more and the cost of the new. We don't have it. Okay, so that was, um, you saw the um, Mr. Elvis Efri Yankra uh, of the NDC and also earlier on we saw the Commissioner herself of the EC, uh, Madam Jean Mensa there. So clearly there's an issue about uh, whether or not to acquire um, a new biometric voter registration system. And so this week, uh, the IPAC um, meeting was to allow some shortlisted IT firms to you know, um, uh, present their solutions for the biometric um, voter registration system. The NDC staged a walkout because they said they had been deceived into thinking that they were coming for or going for an emergency meeting only to find out that it was to observe uh, you know these presentations by the IT firms that had been shortlisted question is honorable mm. there's this debate whether to get it or not the EC things we should have it and it's saying that well it had an IT consultant from Canada um, do an audit and there was that recommendation for an audit NDC is saying, we don't know anything about this. Let's see the reports. And in the reports here now, you, we just heard that, you know, that the EC is, an, is yet to make that available to the NDC. So my interest really is that I do know that back in 2015, I believe there was an eminent, a five-member eminent panel 
that was constituted to look into the, you know, the petitions that were coming for the register. Exactly. And then that panel returned with, if you like, a verdict of no, that the, the, the case for a new register was unconvincing. So my question is, post that determination, what has changed to lead to this decision that, yes, we need, you know, because I believe the eminence panel was set up for well, a reason. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Um, usually when it comes to search discussions, I wish you could get somebody from the electoral commission. Exactly. Too. They have a PR department. They should be able to talk about some of these things as, as much as possible. We, we don't want to be exactly. seen Honorable to be Obi -Am talking Exactly. Honorable Obiyam was not for, speaking as a representative yeah, of spokesperson for the, of the EC. That I have there. been a member of IPAC for over 10 years now, mm -hmm. since um, Chairman Jake yeah. Pichibilante's time during Dr. Frejan's um, time. Um, there are areas that the EC think that is their domain. For instance, procurement. Uh, but even that, I can tell you that as far as I've known, these two major political parties always have representatives on the procurement committee of EC from parliament. You understand? That is even how far they are ready to go when it comes to procurement that we think is their domain. Now, what are the issues? This week, there have been about three or four meetings. I have seen them as technical meetings. Because I'm at APAC, I usually do the legal and electoral matters. Okay. So when they invited us for this um, presentation of equipment and those things, he said that the technical people should go, unless they think that there are some legal and electoral okay. issues that we should also be part of it. Now, EC has come out to say that we need new equipment for various reasons. One major one being the fact that now if you go for registration and elections, the machines, the equipment available cannot capture our fingers. So that even at the last elections, the incidence of face only was so high. People come, they cannot be verified biometrically. So you have to use their face. And there's a form that you have to fill that this person could not be captured. So it's face only. EC says they want to reduce this as much as possible. So because of that, they need new equipment. Because of that, they want to introduce new technology. Then we say that the technical people, go and sit down with them. Let them explain. If there are any issues, raise those issues. That is it. Now, our friends are bringing in one aspect that they were not consulted. They were not invited early enough. But the invitation given to MPP is the same invitation given to our parties. And they invited us, gave us notice. I have all the records here. So the invitation was purposely to come and yes, observe. Yes, that's how some, some of us said that the technical people should go. Because we knew why they had invited us. And then the second thing is, why, you upgrade, why don't you upgrade? Um, it's less expensive than uh, buying new equipment. The AC is saying that we've done assessment of upgrading and then new equipment in, at the data center level. And when we were supposed to upgrade, the figures they brought us, 15 million. But when we did a new one, it came to 7.5 million. So that it doesn't necessarily follow that if you're upgrading, it's, it's, cheaper. It, it's cheaper. Now, the main issue is that show us uh -huh. that if you want to do a new one, it will be cheaper than upgrading. But at this stage, how do you expect EC to show it? This is a time that vendors are coming to bid and show what they can offer. So how can they easily say that um, when we do this? They have the figures, but they can't disclose it. This is what we'll be expecting. So if you're a vendor and you're going to bid above that, you may not be successful. But it doesn't mean they should tell the whole world that uh, upgrading will cost us this, new one will cost us this, at this stage. So the issue at this stage is... Uh, so you're saying there's no decision clearly now that we are going for... A new one based on some figures but that let them come and demonstrate yes. and then we get their quotations yes. if the quotations turn out to be cheaper than the cost of upgrading then we go with no, the new one what i'm saying is that because it's competitive because various vendors have been invited to come and show what they can do and later on even show their cost it's not for it's not for easy down to tell us about the cost Very because well. they haven't even arrived at the cost. Honorable, we need to take a break. We'll take a break okay. and we'll be back shortly well, to finalize. Them. I know. <laughs> the breasts are more than that. <laughs> so we'll see you yeah. in a bit.
Come back. We're in the final lap of the show, and we are trying to look at exactly <coughs> what caused the walkout um, by the opposition parties, including the NDC, from an IPAC meeting this week. Um, Honorable Obi Amo is making a submission. I'll turn to you to wrap up, wrap yeah. up on that for me, the, so that the I have, most, because we most, don't have much time. Yeah, the most important thing is that um, the EC has said that they are still open to listen to concerns and grievances by any party, but the others are still open and that they think going forward the best way is to dialogue. We also believe in that. Mm. But as far as we are concerned, um, we are more interested in making sure that EC does its work and we as parties, we also play our role right. and we make sure that the, 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 the playing field is level and then we move on. That's mm. all that we've been doing all this time. Okay, well. Where it means that we have to go to court to we insist go. on the right. We go where the court interprets whether we are right or they are right. That's fine. Dr. Oh. Seydou, what do you make of this whole discussion? First of all, do you think we need a new biometric voters register? <coughs> I, I, I don't know until I know what is wrong mm. with the current register. Mm -hmm. Because I think we, we use the current register just for 2016 elections. So I'm not sure what's wrong with it. But maybe if technically there's something wrong with it, the EC should let us know. And then the measures that they think they can take, they can take to address it, especially the measures that will bring efficiency and less conflict after 2020 elections, but also maybe at a relatively cheaper price to the state. So I, I believe uh, they should be very open with information so that we all know. Because people are asking, personally, I have been asking, we just use this biometric register for only the 2016 elections. Why do we need a new register? So apparently, maybe the EC, the public, a first unit of the EC should come out with the information. Maybe these are the challenges that we have identified with the current register. And we believe that using the same register in 2020 is going to create this problem or that. Then this is what we, we want to address it. But I, I don't understand what is going on. So I, I, I seem to, to be at a loss. Why we need a, a, a new register now? But I also think IPAC is supposed to be a consensus building exactly. platform rather than a platform of disagreement. So whatever the issue might be, political parties are the direct beneficiaries of the processes of the EC, but also from the, uh, the, the voters we said that we have. They should be able to join your and then uh, come up with a, a solution that will be acceptable to all of them so that we can have a peaceful election 2020. Very well, and Madam Jodhbara, your perspective well, on this you moving forward. Much. Your party is saying that they've been deceived. I must be honest, how many, how many events cast their shadows? <laughs> When all those efforts and all those uh, absolutely <coughs> needless and lawless attempts were made to totally remove Charlotte Osei okay. from that commission, true. we all knew then that this was actually going to be a sign of things to come. But for the manner of the appointment of the current EC commissioner, I'm sure that maybe there will be a lot less suspicion and ambiguity and ambivalence. And of course, if you even look at it in context, Note that from the moment Charlotte Osei was announced as a nominee, there was enormous agitation, attempts to discredit her, enormously disparaging to say the least. I believe that Madame Jean Osei has suffered a lot less. But when it comes to the working processes and procedures of the Electoral Commission, look at other jurisdictions around us. The UK has just come out of an election. Have you had any conversations around who the EC is? Do you even know who the Electoral Commissioner is in the United Kingdom? Do you know who takes care of the Electoral College? If we want institutions to work, we must actually be seen to be allowing them to work. Right. If we want individuals to occupy positions of trust and be seen as trustworthy, not just by other political parties, but of course by citizens as well, we need to take our appointments more seriously. The manner of criticism, the level of mistrust, the level of accusation that came from the new patriotic party set the tone for what is happening today. Very well. In any case, I can, mm -hmm. IPAC is a body that was established. Do you remember every effort Charlotte Say made in her day to introduce any form of amendment? The levels that our opponents at the time took it to. Today, it is actually heartwarming that the Honorable Obi admits that considering the work of the same IPAC, they believe that an individual who occupies the seat as commissioner at any time will be unable to manipulate the election to suit anybody. Mm -hmm. 
let's hope that the next 10 years we'll see an electoral commissioner whose work will be objective, whose appointment will receive acclaim across the divide mm, so that there's less suspicion, there's less deception, and less room Thank for you. all this acrimony that Thank we do you. not require. I give the last minute to you, Doc. Well, I'm not thinking very quickly. Uh, I call this déjà vu. Déjà vu in the sense that uh, if you listen to uh, my sister Joyce, uh, during her submission, there's one name that keeps ringing up, Charlotte Osei, Charlotte Osei. So uh, it's always characteristic of uh, uh, parties. And I believe one fundamental thing that the Electoral Commissioner especially needs to uh, do is to win the trust of the, the populace. Because uh, when there's lack of trust, I don't think such a simple exercise like this, changing a, a, what do they call it, a register or machines, should create uh, any kind of uh, problem. Because at the end of the day, I believe the political parties are interested in having a very credible exactly. and effective election. So anything that will endure to, I mean, the credible elections, I think they should accept it. But okay. it all boils down to lack of trust. Gotcha. And, and I would why say, IPAC was there to ensure yes, that I think it boils down to lack like of trust. And I'll, I'll, I'll honestly and more or less respectfully uh, employ the electoral commissioner to be a little bit circumspect when it comes to public engagement. out engagements. Mm. You know, if you remember, Afarija was not the type who used to you can make all your noise. She will never speak to the media. He has she has a lot of uh, people who can speak on her behalf. Media, yeah. mm -hmm. I think she should she should be measured mm. in terms of her public uh, utterances and stuff like that. Very well. Thank you very much. On that note, we bring the um, we, we draw the curtains on the show this morning. Thank you so much for making a date with us. And to my panelists, I say a big thank you to you, Honorable Obi Amwa, Deputy Minister for Local Government and Rural Development, also MP for the Papim South Constituency, Madam Joyce Bawa Mokhtari, spokesperson for um, former President J. John Dramani Mahama, Dr. Ahmed Janapur, a senior lecturer in the University of Education, Winneba, and Dr. Ali Bissay, the senior lecturer, Department of Political Science, University of Ghana. We'll be back here same time next week. Do have yourselves a very, very good weekend. Bye-bye.